What's the youngest a person can go inside of a chamber? How do you help children deal with the pressure changes of the hyperbaric experience? Those are the things we're gonna cover in today's video. We get comments all the time about, you know, how young can somebody go inside of a chamber? What's the age that it's safe to go inside of a hyperbaric chamber to get treatments? The answer is it obviously depends on why we're using the chamber and what the goal is of the chamber. However, what I'll tell you in general terms is that we've had patients that are days old, weeks old, of course, everything in between all the way through, you know, a hundred plus years old. And so what pressure we're using, what percentage of oxygen are we using? You know, all of these things are going to vary depending on what the need is and what the reason is, you know, for this person to go inside that chamber. But as far as age goes in general, there is no age cutoff that says, well, you, you can't go into a chamber unless you're, you know, this old and you know, this tall, it's not like it's a roller coaster. So virtually any age is possible and any age is appropriate, again, just depending on the use. Generally speaking, younger patients are going to lower pressures or they're going to pressurize a little slower than an adult. But throughout the course of a treatment and throughout the course of the process, it's possible that even younger people need to go to higher pressures, again, just depending on what the goal is of that treatment. The next question is, well, how do you help a child, especially a younger child, equalize their ears or deal with the pressure changes? Or maybe that child is a little bit older, six years old, eight years old, 12 years old, but perhaps there's cognitive challenges or developmental delays or communication challenges. And we want to make sure that we're keeping these children safe throughout the process of the treatment. So let's cover infants first. Obviously, we can't communicate the same way with an infant that we would with an older child. And obviously they're not able to actively or purposefully equalize the pressure in their ears. And so we need techniques or strategies for doing so. To some extent, you can think about this not too unlike being on an airplane. So what are some of the things or strategies that we use on an airplane? Well, we know that either nursing or bottle feeding during takeoff and or landing helps keep that child more comfortable. Why? Because the sucking action has a natural effect of clearing our ears. And so whether we use nursing as a strategy in the chamber or bottle feeding or just drinking something, swallowing inside the chamber or a pacifier, any of those would really help the child just naturally equalize their ears by creating that sucking response, by creating that swallowing response. We just naturally clear our ears typically doing that. There's another device called an auto vent. And if you're really not trained to use something like that, I don't recommend it but it is a device we use from the outside of the ear that can help manually clear the ear from the outside if we can't create the normal pressure from the inside. But again, unless you're trained to use it, it's not something we would typically recommend. For most cases, nursing, pacifier, or bottle, or drink of some kind is more than enough to actually help somebody equalize their ears. Lastly, in those cases, the other thing that we do is we just pressurize very slowly. It's possible to pressurize so slowly that it's almost imperceptible and you're keeping them safe and they're able to just naturally and calmly equalize those pressure changes because the pressure changes are happening so slowly. So in the beginning, anytime you're doing these sessions with someone younger, you want them to have a good experience because if they have a terrible experience on the first session or two, you're making it far less likely that they're going to continue the process. We know that hyperbarics are not going to change most of the things that we're trying to help somebody with in a session or two. This is something we're going to be doing for months and months at a time. And so it's really important to have a positive experience in the beginning. So going slower in the beginning, especially the first step of the pressurization process, will really help those kids equalize. And if you have something like nursing or a pacifier and a bottle and you're pressurizing slowly, you're really maximizing the likelihood that it's going to go smooth. I get a question all the time, how do I know that they're okay? Like if they're not equalizing, they can't communicate that with me. And so how do we know that they're safe and okay? I will tell you this, it won't be a secret. Just like on the airplane, when the airplane is landing and your child is uncomfortable, it's typically not a secret. The whole plane knows. It'll be similar inside the chamber. If they were having a problem, it will not be a secret. They will become very uncomfortable. It could even be painful. The important thing to recognize that's different between hyperbaric and that airplane is that airplane is landing whether your child is comfortable or not. In the hyperbaric environment, we have full control over the speed and the depth of the dive, meaning if they're showing signs of discomfort, which is usually wiggling their jaw, pulling on their ear, rubbing their head, right? We're always looking for these very subtle signs. If we see them well before it's painful, we can control 
how quickly or how slowly we're pressurizing and depressurizing to make sure that we keep them comfortable. And that's a critical step in this process is helping to keep the child comfortable during the changes, not waiting until they're in pain and then doing something about it. But monitoring those signs and symptoms, adjusting the pressure or the rate of pressurization and depressurization accordingly, you can absolutely keep those children comfortable, happy, and safe during the pressure changes. In those older sort of toddler plus ranges, you know, four, five, six years old, we can certainly start using other drink options like a, just a bottle of water, that same swallowing effect. They also may not know how to hold their nose and blow, but typically they'll know how to blow their nose, especially if you're helping them. And so sometimes we might have somebody bring in, you know, a rag or a tissue and start the process of blowing their nose. But as they start building that pressure and blowing, Let's say you're using a handkerchief, you hold it near their nose, you have them inhale and start blowing out of their nose, and then mid-blow, you just hold their nose closed. And usually they're going fast enough in that blow where you can actually help them equalize their ears in that moment. In many cases, the swallowing is more than enough. And again, just like you did with the infants, pressurizing a little slower, helping them become more comfortable with that process, they'll be very able to equalize on their own that way. We're still looking for the same signs and symptoms as we would with the infants in terms of tugging on the ear or moving their jaw, you know, or rubbing their ear, rubbing their head. And we can manipulate the pressure changes and slow them down or speed them up accordingly based on what we need to do. The older kids are more likely going to understand how to equalize their ears on their own. They've been on maybe a few airplanes. Chewing gum is appropriate at this point. Again, bringing a bottle of water and practicing some swallowing techniques, and then even teaching them the Valsalva, the pinch your nose and blow, so that they could feel their ears pop. And now they're gonna have a very easy and successful visit as far as that part goes. Sometimes those children, depending on the ages, but we have some type of cognitive impairment, cognitive challenge, or developmental delays, we might go back and just think this through more like what we did on the infant side where the communication pathways might not be that clear. We have to really hone in on those signals, the tugging and the rubbing, right? The discomfort, sometimes the banging. And in those cases, we know that they're starting to become uncomfortable and we need to change or manipulate the speed of the pressure changes to help make them more comfortable. In some of those cases for the first few sessions, we might really bring the speed of pressurization down a lot and just pressurize really slowly. There have been times where we've taken for the first session or two or three, 30 minutes to get to the pressure we want, 30 minutes to get back down to the pressure, and that's the session. Is that a perfect session from a therapeutic value standpoint? Maybe not, but is that the perfect session to allow somebody to be exposed to the therapy, understand the process, have a good experience, and then be willing to come back the next time? Yes. And again, this isn't about each individual session being the most important hour in their life. It's about helping them become comfortable with the process so that we can commit to a long-term care plan because that's probably what they're going to need. And if we could have a few big wins in the beginning, just being in the chamber, getting exposed to pressure, depressurizing, and smiling, we're in a good place. As we build on those sessions, we can speed up the rate of pressurization. They will slowly learn how to manage the pressure on their own. And before you know it, five or six sessions later, we're doing the sessions exactly the same way we would do for everybody else, getting maximum therapeutic value, but still keeping that patient happy and safe and comfortable. And that's what's important for that long-term plan. It's important to note that in our office, at least, any patient under 10 is going to be going into the chamber with an adult. That could be an older brother or sister. It could be a mother, father, uncle, grandparent, whatever the family is comfortable with, but they're not going in alone. Now, I say that for a few reasons. Number one, because now there's two people that need to handle the pressurization experience, but most importantly, because the parent's response or the sibling's response or the caregiver's response to the experience is also going to help drive the child's response to that experience. In other words, if the parent or the guardian or the caregiver is nervous, the child is likely going to be nervous. If that person is calm, reserved, and excited, then that child will likely be calm, reserved, and excited. And they're going to be looking to the person inside the chamber with them for how they're going to respond, especially for that first session or two. This is critical. So we really want to keep a happy and calm environment. The person accompanying that child into the chamber needs to be happy and looking forward to 
what that process is going to bring. I hope you found this video helpful. These are some of the strategies that we use when we're working with children, both infants through toddlers, through adolescents, and helping them with the experience of dealing with the pressure changes, getting comfortable with the hyperbaric experience so that we could have successful treatments moving forward. I appreciate your time and attention and we'll see you on the next video. So whether you're a chiropractor or a naturopath or an acupuncturist or a DO or even an MD, but you're looking at hyperbarics through this lens, the lens that I'm describing, which is applying hyperbarics for all these off-label conditions, this is the class that teaches that. And right now it's the only class that teaches this type of hyperbarics in this way and that's an actual certification course. Check out hbotusa.com and uh, right across the, the top, you'll see upcoming events. You can click on that and it'll show you uh, when our next courses are gonna be.